Hello and welcome back and thank you for joining us today for our last session of the summit from TCR Group on reducing your carbon footprint is more complicated than simply replacing diesel G GSE with EGSE. I'm joined here by Christoph Phillips, CAO of TCR International. Christoph will be answering any of your questions at the end of the discussion. Um, so do make sure that you use the live discussion button uh, on the bottom right hand corner of your screens to submit any questions that you may have and we will do our best to get through them at the end of the presentation. But for now, Christoph, I'll hand over to you to start the session. Okay, thank you very much, Lily May. Um, let me start by just introducing myself, I think. Um, I'll keep that part as short as possible. I'm just trying to get to the next slide. Oh, well. So, um, as you all know, this session will be mainly focused on explaining to people in a more practical way why uh, going electric is not always that straightforward as it sounds. So the first question I would ask you is, okay, who am I and why do I believe I have some relevance in explaining or discussing about this topic? Well, as said, I'm Christoph Phillips, I'm the CEO of TCR International, and we are a company that is specialized in the providing of maintenance services, workshop solutions, but also around uh, financing and procurement of GSC and infrastructure solutions. We're having a wide uh, global spread. Um, we have 17 countries where we're active, more than 155 uh, airports, and we have more than 35,000 assets, which are our own uh, fleet, and we maintain another 10,000 um, across the globe. So as I said, how do we cooperate? We typically act as an integrator and we try to bring together the knowledge we have established over the years and link it to what we know and what we learned um, by operating on the apron with the various stakeholders. So this is the short part about TCR. I think that's the, the least interesting part. What we will do now is actually establish why are we having this discussion today? Well, as you all know, and you look at what uh, different airports, airlines, handlers are all publishing, they are committing to strong um, carbon footprint reductions. Part of the carbon footprint reduction that we see, or those ambitions that have been published, are driven by legislation. So some part is imposed, and it's not a matter of choice or not, but also a big chunk of the ambition that we see is the desire from different entities, different companies to build a better future for our children, but also the people that uh, we, yeah, we, we live with in this world. Of course, it is very clear that if we want to achieve those ambitions, massive steps need to be made, massive changes need to be implemented in order to be able to reach such an ambitious target. But let me start first with a, with a, with a thing which I thought was quite interesting. Um, actually, on the left-hand side, you see a presentation or a, a picture of a slide that was presented by Fraunhofer and IATA. And um, Fraunhofer is a, is a German-based consulting company specializing in, for example, in this case, um, analysis of turnarounds and analysis, analysis of the carbon footprint impact. What is interesting to see, and it's a bit small, but if you yeah, try, you will see that there is a lighter number and a more yellow number against every of those assets. And this is the impact of the CO2 reduction or the exhaust of CO2 uh, in carbon um, that you can expect from a diesel alternative being the yellow one and an electrical alternative being the lighter uh, white one. Initially, people would expect when you say I go from diesel to electrical, people would expect to see zeros everywhere because uh, it's electrical, so it cannot be having a CO2 exhaust. Of course, if you really do the exercise correctly, and that's what they did, um, the honest answer is, of course, in order to produce the electricity, you also need, you also have a carbon footprint. In order to build the asset, you also have a carbon footprint. So it's really like um, ensuring that you compare apples with apples, because in the end, you want to make sure that you're committing to impact on the CO2 footprint. So what they learned is that if you electrify, and it's based upon three different plane types, but if you electrify the entire fleet, you're potentially having a target reduction of around 40% of CO2. So for me, the question was, okay, if you then look at the proportion and you say, okay, if, if, if I, by, by changing, investing in a full replacement of my fleet on GSE, I can have an impact of 40%. And that 40% is on a bucket of CO2, which is quite small compared to, for example, the airplanes and the terminals contribution, am I still having material and a significant impact? 
I think it's not a question of do we need it or not. I think if we want to reach the targets, we will have to find optimizations in every single area, being it being GSC, it being the airplanes, it being the terminals and the buildings. But what is more important is how do we make sure that when we invest in those GSC replacements or conversions, that we ensure that we use that money to ensure the maximum impact. So a methodology that we use, but again, there are various alternatives possible, is what we call the Uzi method. And it's really around how do you make sure that the GSC you have on the ramp, and GSC includes things like buses, catering trucks, and so on, but how do you use that fleet to the full extent and how do you use it in the right way? I'll explain in more detail uh, what we mean with that. It's also once you use the fleet correctly, okay, how do you make sure you have the right size of fleets? And last, once you know you have the right size, is how do you introduce innovation? It could be electrification, it could be hydrogen or any alternative, it could be autonomous, uh, in order to further decrease the impact on the CO2 footprint. So I think it is important before we go into some concrete examples that I show you um, a bit more in detail what the logic is behind the uh, Uzi approach. So when we say, how do you use the fleet? Well, most of the time when we start talking to customers, they will say, okay, if I have to go electrical, I need to buy a new electrical asset. And by having an electrical asset, I'm going green. Well, you will hopefully see by the end that just buying the electrical asset is not going to help because it's an extremely complicated decision to be made. Uh, what's the battery you're going to choose? What's the impact on the chargers and so on and so on. And how do you implement it in the operation? Because it's not about fueling when it's empty, it's about charging, which takes more time. So th the question is, how do we do this? So if we look at the use component, people will say, as I mentioned, going green is costing a lot of money. We disagree. The first step you can do is ensure that what you have is used properly. And the things we noticed is an example, a practical example is idle running. We installed some telematics on the fleet of, of, that is in use by some of our customers. And we assess together with them how much of the time that an engine is running, it is actually idle running. And we noticed that the families that were mostly affected is of course the belt loader, is a loader, is a pushback, um, those kind of families. And then we went into more detail and we started asking them, okay, but why is it idle running? Because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, because a pushback, for example, in theory, it's only engaged for like 15, 16 minutes, but we saw that uh, the idle running took a lot longer. And so we learned that in many cases, the engine is running because people want to heat in winter, they want to cool in summer. But then of course, does it make sense to have a very serious, significant size engine having a serious impact on CO2 exhaust and fuel uh, running to heat or to cool? So, Simple solutions we implemented is by replacing that need with a small electrical heater, again, compliant, safe, but also not at the detriment of the comfort of the user of the asset, because that's also equally important in ESG. It's the social component. So by doing so, the customer can actually save on fuel because you're not running. Second, you will save on CO2 exhaust and in consequential, uh, the trading with uh, CO2 certificates. And also, which is sometimes forgotten, is that often uh, maintenance is triggered by the running hours of an engine. And in many cases, the running hours determination includes idle running because it's the, the counter that is used as an objective base. But it means that you're also over maintaining some of the assets because of the idle running where it should not have been the case. So you have three layers of savings. It's the certificates, the fuel consumption, and the maintenance on an asset. So what did you spend? Almost nothing. But you reduced your footprint and you save money. That's the first important thing. It's just one of the examples that we see. Then once you're sure that you use the fleet in the most optimal way, the second question is around the size of the fleet. Typical examples, and these are the most extreme, there are simpler examples, but pooling is an example of how to rethink the way you size the fleet. Again, when you say pooling, pooling could mean within the hands of one customer across multiple terminals in one airport. It could be across different handlers, different operators, in one airport, and it could be actually an airline that pulls its own fleet or rented fleet across different stations in a regional area, in a geographical area. So in the next part, we'll um, give some more concrete examples. And then, but you, as you can see, sorry to finish this on the fleet size, you will see that pooling, it does require some more investment, but it really depends, of course, on the setup. 
You can go for dedicated stent allocation. You can go to, let's say, one remote location where you put all the assets and people pick up and they uh, bring back. So depending on the choices you make, you can go for all new and take the opportunity or you use what is there already and you put it in one pool. So depending on, on the choices you make, you will see there is more or less capital needed. But compared to the first step, there is capital needed, that's for sure. Once you're sure that you optimize the fleet size and you know what you need, then you can look at the recommendation at alternative energy sources, um, innovation. It's clear that, of course, if you have to replace one asset with another, depending on the age and so on, the financial complications are more significant and investment cost as a result is more important. Of course, the impact on the CO2 will also be continuously improving um, in a positive manner. So that's the logic be behind the, uh, the approach. And depending on the situation, the type of customer, you will have more options within the left side corner um, or more options on the right hand corner, or you can do something across the entire, depending on the asset family, if it's under your control or not. So, of course, to, to facilitate these kind of things, people need data and tools. And we have some tools that we developed, but again, those are readily available in the market for some, some are more purpose built. Um, but I think it's really important that people um, truly understand that if you want to make statements around your ambition, it's extremely important you can define and assess the as is. And so an example is with telematics, in our case, for example, we calculate the CO2 footprint. We know the engine hours, we know uh, based upon IATA and OEM standards what the, the, the exhaust of CO2 is. Um, and so we have a sort of live calculation of what the CO2 footprint is of the fleet we have in our different stations at that moment in time. The as is, ex is extremely important. But also the way uh, the fleet is used and across different areas, it's actually possible to, um, to make sure that um, we map this data in, in the most efficient way and translate it into heat maps. So different tools um, all needed in order to support um, the projects that we're going to elaborate on. So I think this was more the, the introduction part and, and, and more of the, 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 concept, the conceptual part, let's say. But what I do believe is important is give you some concrete examples of, of how we worked with customers and, and where they found that they could have impact, but maybe in a way they didn't expect it. And also what were the learnings, um, some of the benefits, but also some of the challenges. Um, because as I said, it is more complicated than we initially thought ourselves equally. So the first case is really around um, the you, the use. And it's a typical, it's an atypical case because we are talking about how do we decarbonize? And you would say, okay, in this case, we're talking about electrical tractors. Why would you look at electrical tractors? They're already electrical. But the constraints that the, the, the customer had in this instance is they have a very significant fleet in a um, single station on electrical tractors. And as a, as a result of that, because they did a massive electrification exercise on that fleet, they have two challenges. Where do we find the money for the rest, the next steps? So the CapEx, the investment. The second question was, okay, I have limited infrastructure on the airport and it's going to be extremely difficult to extend and costly to extend because there are constraints imposed by various elements. So the question we try to raise with them is, how could we make sure that we use what is there in the most optimal way so that we free up the capacity, reducing the need to invest in infrastructure and reducing and freeing up some spending that you can use for alternative use. So we did an analysis. We, we installed, um, again, battery trackers, telematics on the batteries of the fleet. And we started analyzing when assets were used, when the pool on the battery was highest, what should be the minimum, maximum amplage or amp of the um, capacity, let's say, of the, the battery. And some of the learnings we, 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 we had was that by looking at the, the data and putting it in a certain methodology, we were able to, to reach the conclusion on the right hand side. So the analysis provided the data, the methodology is important. Why is the methodology equally important than the data? because you need to look at the various components. As I said, an electrical tractor is not just an asset you buy and that's it. If you make a choice on, a, on an asset, an electrical tractor, then you also have to make a choice on a battery. Depending on the choice of the battery you make, you have to make a choice on infrastructure. Of course, typically the infrastructure you use is not only used by yourself. It is used by yourself, other handlers, other airlines. It could be various people. It is important to note that the choice of battery does trigger a certain number of choices you can make on chargers. And so 
there is a first attempt or a first challenge, which is how do I make sure that the battery I choose for this family doesn't require a charger type or does allow a charger type that also allows me to work with the other batteries that I still have on the other fleet in my um, uh, in my in my um, yeah, in my property or rented for the operation. But that's the question you ask. But then there is the second question: if other people are using it, what batteries are they using? Because maybe that's also not compatible. So a simple question as choosing an electrical tractor has an implication on the choice of battery, has an implication on infrastructure. And then a component people typically forget is also the team, the people. How many people do you need to implement or not implement a certain solution? And so this is what we're trying to explain is that, okay, you can just buy the trucks, do the analysis, but then there is the complexity behind it. What was the outcome of the exercise we did with this customer? We realized by swapping from one battery type, which was lead acid, to a different type, and it wasn't lithium, it was a 100% lead-based battery, um, but we, we were able to increase the uh, capacity of the battery. We were able to reduce the fleet with 30%. But as you can see on 200 plus assets, that's quite significant. It was also triggering a staff optimization because in the past, every person had his own tractor. Of course, if you have lesser tractors, because they're not needed, you also were able to optimize on the staffing. Um, but also it allowed us to, to, re, to avoid replacement of batteries for assets which were not necessarily used. Um, we also, all the assets that were on the ramp, the 30% in excess, they were also having maintenance every month, every year. And all of that resulted in savings. Second, the fact that you have 30% lesser assets allows you to free up the capacity for charging. So that was a, a possibility then for us to make sure that we yeah, had an ability to implement or convert different families that were not yet converted because we freed up capacity on the infrastructure and we freed up funding by not spending it on maintenance and by being able to sell or use, meaning avoid CapEx for the same customer, but in different stations because the assets were already in their portfolio and they didn't have to buy new in that instance. So this is just one example and maybe, as I said, atypical because decarbonization by looking at an electrical fleet doesn't at first sight make a lot of sense, but it did for them because it was an enabler. Second case, it's around the sizing. Um, the most common example, some of you may have heard of it um, before, but it's the, the Luton case um, where the entire airport, um, except for the pushbacks to be honest, but all the other families are now pulled. Pushbacks will be this year, um, the last family going into the scope. And what we did is we, we worked, and, and some of you may have seen in previous sessions that we talk about the apron trilemma, but very briefly, why is an apron trilemma logic important? It's a, it's a triangle in which we try to evaluate if we have a project on an apron or on an airport, what's the continuity of the solution? So meaning, do we have security of provision of the source that you're trying to go to? So if you say, I go electrical, do you have guarantee that within the next five, seven years, you will still have access to electricity? Because if tomorrow the government decides that every household needs to have a drive only electrical cars, will there be enough electricity? So it's about continuity is one parameter. The other one is sustainability. Of course, it's about, okay, you can go for biodiesel, you can go for electrical, you can go for conversion. But as I said, what's the impact on the sustainability aspect of it? Um, different cost, different consequence, but it's something that needs to be evaluated. And the last uh, corner of the triangle is of course about affordability. We're all economical or we're all financially driven companies. We need to exist. We need to be in the end profitable. That's also um, a fact. So how does that relate in the equation? And so this is an exercise we did um, with the airport, but also together with all the stakeholders because they were all affected. We took a phased approach and we actually came to the implementation. What are the main learnings we had from this project is first of all, we started together with the stakeholders and we initially thought we'll put, it's a small airport, We'll put um, centrally at one location all those assets that we need and people just pick them up and bring them back and we use geofencing and thematics and so on and so on. But very rapidly we learned that in practice the most efficient way was not to have a one-fits-all. So we, we learned that we would put steps, we would put GPUs and belt loaders on stand and the tractors are shared and used across different stands and across the airport. And by doing this, of course, we went a bit against the initial logic of the project because we said, okay, the first logical thing was to say, okay, there is congestion, there is uh, a lot of accidents, on-time performance is not good. So we ended up with more assets than we had before because every stand now had belt loaders and steps and, and so on. 
But what we saw, and you see the benefits on the right-hand side, there were benefits for the airport, the handlers and the airlines. No damage, almost no damage at all, because the assets are not moving anymore. So the damage costs, but also the implication of damage, accidents, investigations, replacement hit, all disappeared. We saw on-time performance go up, imp uh, improve significantly because the assets are already there on stand. It's like the Formula One pit stop solution. But what is important, of course, in the entire exercise is that, first of all, it doesn't work at every airport and it doesn't have to work at every airport. It could also work at the terminal level. It could work at um, a family of assets. So I think it's important. It's not a one fits all. But the logic behind it may have benefits for certain setups at certain locations at certain moments in time. But it's not simple. It involves a lot of different stakeholders that all need to align. And we have to accept such a model is disruptive because it changes the business model of the majority of the stakeholders on the airport. For the better, for the worse, I think operationally for the better, but it means a lot of change. And change, as you all know, is not always that straightforward. This one, again, I, I, I purposely show you some cases which are atypical. And you could argue, again, like with the batteries on the electrical, we're talking about decarbonization, and you show me pooling of non-motorized fleets. Why would you do this? It's a bit like when you renovate a house. When you renovate your house, you're also not going to start painting unless you first removed all the carpet. Uh, you removed all the clutter, because you want to be sure that you have a clean canvas to do all the work in the most efficient and safe way possible. If you look at the apron and you would look at what's, what's there in volume, it is the non-motorized fleet. We installed some telematics on, on some of our customers' fleet and we learned that around, again, depending on the airport customer and so on and so on, but in average, between 20 and 30% of the non-motorized fleet is never ever used because it's parked too far and people don't use it because they don't, they're not going there to pick it up. Um, and that's immense, 20 to 30 percent. So if you can only imagine if tomorrow you were able to say, okay, first of all, as a customer, I don't need to own, rent, maintain those assets anymore. Not a major saving because they're not the most expensive, but it's a saving. Why wouldn't you like a saving? Second, you will, you will save on space because what is one of the biggest challenges? It's congestion and accidents. What's the most common accident that happens? It's a motorized hitting a non-motorized part. What's the consequence? Asset motorized is damaged. You need to replace it with a backup unit. So you increase the problem uh, uh, of congestion on the apron. The accident itself, it's also within the ESG mindset. It's not what you want. It's disruptive. It causes a lot of consequential time and cost. And it's not taking into consideration the fact that you put at risk someone's health and someone's integrity, which is not acceptable. So by doing this, you improve the safety, reduce some cost, but also you free up space in the sense of often when we try to work with airports on, we can go electrical, but we need infrastructure. It's where do we put infrastructure because we do not have the space. If you can reduce with 20% and the non-motorized fleet on an airport, I can assure you it's a lot of surface you can have available for other purposes. So yes, atypical, but still of value in the discussion according to myself. And the last case that I wish to present, I'm just checking a bit on time, but um, the last case that I'm using or wishing to present is e-buses. I know it's a very um, important topic uh, these days. It's, it's, it's one of the uh, important, say, families that I believe will have a very significant impact on reunification of the apron. Um, the apron. But Again, as we said in previous, when we help or work with customers, what we notice is that most people say, okay, we, we had a call from someone and they can provide me with, I have 12 diesel buses with 12 electrical buses. And um, okay, we, we wish to go. Okay, fine. So we, we always recommend the customer, let's do the study and design phase because it is not just that. And that's what I'm going to show to you uh, at hand of a very simple example. And then once you know what you need and what the complications and the impacts are, you can do the implementation and you do the follow-up huh? because it's not once it's there, it's the fleet management. How do you use the batteries? How do you charge the batteries? Is your operating process correct? Do you optimize it so you can reduce the fleet size and so on and so on? But that's the last step of this. So why, why is the phase of design and study so important? 
as I said before, okay, I want another bus. I want, I have 12 buses. Okay, I want 12 electrical buses. First question you will get, what's the battery technology? Actually, you will not get the question because typically a manufacturer of a bus will tell you, I have an LTO solution, I have an LFP, an NMS, uh, NMC, or an LCO solution. So it's not a choice. But what's the consequence of not having a choice? I'm not saying it's bad. All of them work well, but they have benefits and they have also some challenges that they, they bring. Choosing the battery automatically delivers or forces you to make certain choices on chargers. But regarding or uh, of the type of charger being posit charge uh, like types, uh, which is more versatile or more unique style um, chargers, there's also a discussion around, okay, considering the infrastructure that is there, do I need a depot charger? Do I want a fast charger? Do I want onboard charging, a pantograph? All those kind of things need to be addressed just by making a simple uh, decision. Battery capacity, what's the right capacity? Well, it requires some complicated calculations and an assessment of the operating process. And I think it's important not to, comp uh, to, to replicate it as is. It is important to rethink the way you work and does it make sense and how can we improve? Because it's not just swapping A for B, it is about how does it bring value on CO2, but also on running operation and quality of your passengers. Because in the end, you're still offering a service to a passenger who needs to have comfort during his journey. The fleet size, most common thing is people say, I have 12 diesels, I want 12 electrical. I said, okay, that's fine, it's possible. Um, but how do you know you need 12? Because if your bus is empty, you can just fuel it. If you need to charge it, it takes up till three hours, four hours, depending a bit on the charger type and how much you want to charge. But it takes a lot longer than just fueling. So do you believe you still have 12 diesels and 12 electricals? The answer is not black and white. It will depend on the reality and, and, and you need to do the assessment. Charging locations, typically people say I have a charger there, but I'm giving a practical example. If tomorrow you, you have a bus always waiting at the terminal to pick up the passengers and they spend an average 15 minutes, then logistically it would make more sense to have the charger there because with a 15 minute charge every time, 20 minute charge every time they're there, you can get through the day and you need lesser capacity at every point, but also the buses don't need to move away or to go somewhere else. Of course, in other stations, it doesn't make sense because they are only driving from a centralized parking area mm -hmm. to pick up the passengers. And it's like yeah, plug and play, pick up the passengers and go. And then the charger facility is more common and, and more logical to be put at that centralized storage or sorry, parking location. Supplier, a billion suppliers, but all with their own choices um, on battery and consequential impact of those choices. Again, there is a methodology that can be used. Um, and what comes out of it is typically detailed analysis. It's around what it takes to charge, how long, uh, when you ran out of capacity, what we can do on the operation, um, what's the comparison on fuel saving, and so on and so on. So there is an immense amount of data that comes out. But the question is, of course, how do you convert that data into information that you can use to improve your operation, to improve the, the journey for the customer, and to improve your costs um, in the end? Because that's what it's in my opinion, all about. So I tried in this very short introduction just to give a flavor of the things that people may or may not be thinking of. But for me, the, 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 the common conclusion is that reducing the carbon footprint is affordable, but you need the right partner, the tools and the systems um, in order to have impact. A question I wish to end with is, Often I ask my customers and they don't have the simple, it's not a simple answer, but the question is, what, do you, what are you looking for? Are you looking for, I call it branding in the sense that you can make your entire fleet or a big chunk of your fleet in proportion, go green. You can swap all your diesel steps with electrical, but the impact you will have on the footprint of CO2 is going to be close to zero because the engine is, is almost non-existing on a step. So you can say, yes, I have 70% of my fleet, which is now electrical, but you have zero to very little impact on CO2. Or do you accept to say, okay, I invested my money in only 20% of the fleet, but I had an 80% impact on my CO2 footprint, but I only have 20% of the fleet green. What is important and what is not important? These are honest and, and, and straightforward discussions to be had. And, and I, like I said, there is no right or wrong answer, but I like the trigger and the discussion around it because yeah, Depending on who you ask, you will probably get a different answer. So for all, I hope you felt this was interesting.
Um, and I'm going to pass the, uh, the word to Lily May. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Christoph, um, for such a fantastic presentation. Now, just to the audience, if you do still have any questions, then please keep them coming in and we'll get through them as soon as possible. But for now, perhaps we'll head over to our first question to you, Christoph. And that is, what airports are you working with at the moment? Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit more of a, compli it's a complicated answer in the sense that most of them are covered by an NDA. Um, it sounds maybe a fluffy answer, but it's, as you all know, you will ask me the first time you work, sign an NDA. So that's a bit complicated. But the ones where I'm comfortable that they know and it's published is, is, is of course, around uh, Luton Airport. It's Brussels Airport. Uh, we are working uh, with British Airways in Heathrow Airport, together with Heathrow Airport on Terminal 5 um, cleanification projects. The, we're working um, also in different regions across the globe, but um, I think the, the main driver, to be fair, is at this stage in Europe. Uh, we see, for example, Australia and, and, and APAC in general, I can't say lagging behind because it's not true, certain airports are, are spearheading. Um, but, but in general, the tendency is lesser focused on greenification in the Australian bit from an airport perspective. Um, Asia is strongly focused, India is extremely strongly focused on greenification. Um, there we are starting to work with three airports now, um, but again, uh, that, that's more confidential. And, and some specific topics is also around the Euro Green Deal. Huh? So around the Green Deal, a lot of consortiums have been created with Charlotte de Gaulle, with, uh, with Copenhagen Airport and so on and so on. And then we're part of those, those consortiums. Amazing. And is this applicable to every kind of customer? I think the, the approach... What the approach tries to do is to trigger a reflection. Um, so yes, every type of customer can uh, apply and then will have to apply in one way or another, a change from a certain carbon footprint towards another one, which is significantly lower. Of course, the way you can impact that change as an airport or an airline or a handler will be strongly dependent on, do you own certain families? Do you own GSC or not? Um, if you own it, of course, you can make certain choices. Um, but of course, if you own it, but your end customer or your end user is, of course, saying, I don't care and I don't, because there is a cost. And we, we have to acknowledge if you, the, the way you do it, there is a cost. So if people are supportive, fine. If they're not, then there is that commercial re reality where people are conflicting with, I wish, but I can't. And I think also from, an, um, from another angle is, if you cannot do it because you don't own the GSC, then you'll have to do it around the permit. Um, that you write, um, I think in Spain, in the Spanish tender that is going to be launched, for example, they will put an immense focus on if you want to have a license, you'll have to make very strong commitments on electrification or carbon footprint reduction, whatever it may be, because we always say electrification, but it could be something different, not to be very fair. It could be biodiesel, it could be hybrid solutions like hydrogen slash fuel, it could be hydrogen 100%. So, but I think there are different ways and it will really depend on how you are having a potential impact on that decision making. What is also important is there will be no change if it's something that you wish to do on your own, because it's impossible. You do need the community to come on board because a lot of the things we need are shared and are um, yeah, of importance to get impact. Absolutely. And I guess what I'd like to maybe explore, explore a little bit more is you know reducing your carbon footprint perhaps isn't that simple. Um, so where can you, what can you say to customers? Where can they begin in terms of what can they do to achieve perhaps the larger, longer term wins, but also the smaller and the shorter term wins? I think um, it, it's, it's a bit what I said around the 40% to study, which was performed by the other company, uh, Fraunhofer. There are two ways to look at it. Huh? You could say, okay, it's actually useful for me to have impact in working on spending capital on GSC and, and knowing that I actually potentially can save 40% on a portion of CO2 exhaust in an airport environment, which is significantly bigger. So does it really make sense to put my money and my effort on the GSC side? Or do I put my money on, it's an extreme case of course, but converting a fuel-based plane into an electrical plane? Maybe not most likely, but it's, it will happen one day probably, but okay, that's another discussion. But is that something we wish to do or not? And I think the reality will be, it's not one thing you need to do. The ambitions that are set are that immense 
that you will have to find impactful projects that address the needs of every of those segments. So yes, you will need to work around your terminals and your buildings and insulation and solar and so on. You will need to find solutions to be more optimal. Uh, there is the KLM example. Um, there are different examples uh, of how airports try to find solutions to have impact. And there is a very significant component, which is GSC, because next to maybe the CO2, we talk about CO2 today, but it's within the framework of ESG, environmental social governance. And do not underestimate for the people that use those assets, the noise that a diesel engine that is running, a belt loader is making and producing compared to an electrical, which is almost silent, and the impact it has on the health and the well-being of people. So that's also a component we shouldn't forget. But no, the answer is, I think you could look at it, do I need to? I think you need to address it in every angle, uh, in every uh, segment. And then the second question, that's the most important is, do not see um, electrification as buy a new electrical asset and then I'm there. If you're serious about the footprint, then look at GPUs, pushback, loaders, belt loaders. These are buses, and these are the families that have roughly 80% of your CO2 footprint on an airport in average. And that's when you put money there, you will see, even though it may be limited in the total picture or the bigger picture, you will have the maximum impact on where you can have, have impact. And that makes more sense. So that's the, the high level. Of course, the reality is some airports have GPUs, others have fixed ground power. That's where you need to make the assessment with someone that um, yeah, can facilitate structure and, and, and give direction. Absolutely. And I guess my final question is, what three key takeaways can the audience take from this presentation? Well, the most important is um, electrification is not just buying an electrical asset. I think it's triggered by the fact, and I give the same example, it's triggered by the fact that people at home, when they want to go electric, they buy an electric car and that's it. And yeah, you have a choice to make on what type of charger you want, but it's typically often your house, your connection. So going electric is not impossible. Just imagine to do the same on an apron where multiple people are using it, different battery types exist, different solutions exist, then it becomes a lot more complicated. So going electrical is not just buying an electrical asset and then plug it in. It's not that. The second is make sure you have impact. There is a massive focus from government, uh, governments and so on on greenwashing. We can tell the world that we're going to reduce the footprint with 80% and my fleet is 80% green. But if your impact on the CO2 footprint is only 5% because you selected all the stairs, I'm not sure if you're sincere in the commitment you make, because the commitment is to reduce the footprint, not to say that we are green. Personal opinion, it's not a, it's a, a personal opinion, which I strongly believe in. And then the third one is often it's not about what you're going to do. It's about what you're not going to do. Understand that you can have quick wins, which are maybe less sexy than I'll have autonomous tractors driving around lesser people, lesser accidents, all green, it's a journey. And if you want to reach that ambitious goal in 2030, 2050, you'll have to start taking baby steps in an intelligent way. There is no one ticket will change and get you to that point. It will be incremental learning, incremental moving forward. Um, otherwise, it's unaffordable and it will be too big to chew. These are the three takeaways for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very, very good points made. Um, unfortunately, that is all that we have time for. But just a reminder to everyone that is watching, Christoph will be around to answer any of your questions in the networking room and you can connect with him on the platform. Also head over to our sponsors and exhibitors area to view TCR's exhibitor stand and there'll be someone there to answer any questions that you may have. And also don't forget to use the hashtag International Airport Summit on social media to let us know any final thoughts that you may have. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, this is our last session of the summit. However, do make sure to take advantage of both the networking room and you'll be able to rewatch or catch up on any of the sessions on demand for the next 12 months. Finally, a big thank you to Christoph again for such an excellent discussion and presentation and especially for your time today. And a final thank you to our fantastic audience and for your engagement throughout our summit. We hope to see you all again.